Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com My name's Jason Newland This is Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes And please visit the website If you like what I do Maybe you could leave a testimonial uh, just to tell others what you think it's also a gift me page as well and uh, you can help me to support this free service so I've been reading this book um, what's it called let me get the <laughs> let me get the the correct title so I'm not giving you the wrong title and it's a swear word so if you're easily offended then uh, what are you doing listening to me right the book is called oh no it's on my I'm listening to the book It's I shouldn't take this long, should it? Um, my library. Okay. It's called Fuck It by John Parkin. Right, so that's the name of the book. So, I've been reading, I said I've been reading, I've been listening to the audiobook on Audible. So I, I like to listen to books as well as read them. I'm quite, I'm a very auditory person. So, um, if order to order, audited, if Audible had been around when I was a kid, I would have uh, listened to books probably more than read them. Because it seems to go in, you know. But anyway. I'm not advertising Audible, although it's it is good. But it's up to you if you if you want to join them or not. I don't get paid anything if you do. So, fuck it is a book. It's spelled. It doesn't actually say. You know, it's like hyphened out the uh, the f u c k bit on the title. I think it's a fairly famous book. And wasn't kind of sure what to expect. By the way, that this does fit in with what I'm about to talk about. Something that he says, whatever his name is that wrote it, Michael Parfit was it? I don't know. Um, it talked about. the word meaningful and the way he mentioned it talked about it I started to think about it differently or think about it from a different angle and he said and he says in the book that our lives I'm not sure if I'm saying it in the correct terminology <laughs> that he used, but there's too much meaning. It is meaningful, like we, our lives are full of meaning, but not in a spiritual way, not in a necessarily useful or positive way. But just in an overloaded way. That's what I got from it. The overloaded meaning. The overloaded trying to please other people. You know, family, friends, bosses, uh, your husband, your wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, children. Kind 
customers even, I guess, if you've got your own business or you work in a place where it's customer service based, your colleagues at work, maybe even the bus driver or the person sitting on a, you know, sitting down, giving your seat up for someone, always looking out to help others, which I don't think is a negative thing. But it could be a bit overpowering, a bit too much sometimes. So that's what I'm talking about today in conjunction with anxiety and stress. Because going back to when I, well, I talk about 2002, November, when I had my first panic attack. Well, in all honesty, that wasn't the first time that I'd had a panic attack. It's just the first time that I recognised and was absolutely terrified by what was going on. Um, previously, I'd worked in a nightclub and I was at a party afterwards going back to, I don't know, probably 1999, 2000. And I couldn't breathe. I had to leave the club, couldn't breathe. I put it down to drugs. Again, something perhaps I shouldn't sort of not glorify anything, but the fact is, at that time, that's what I put it down to. But the same thing happened another time when I was completely no alcohol, no nothing, just I put it down to the place being too smoky because that was when you could smoke indoors in nightclubs. It happened when I was watching a comedy movie and this was again probably 99 yeah, it must have been 1999 because I was still smoking. And I'd smoked a joint. And I started laughing and I couldn't stop laughing. And I started choking. I couldn't breathe. Had to go in the garden. And I put that down to the joint. See, what I didn't realise at the time that me laughing had nothing to do with panic or anxiety. Me coughing, probably due to the joint, you know, smoking my lungs, uh, you know, choking a little bit because I was laughing so much. It was a very funny scene in a movie. But in the past... Before that time, if I'd been laughing and I was like coughing and stuff, I would never in a million years think, oh, I'm going to die now. That wouldn't come into my mind. It wouldn't even, it wouldn't even bother me. But for some reason, on those three occasions that I mentioned, all three occasions, I felt like... I, I was going to die. Like, you know, I couldn't breathe and relatively I've always been kind of healthy physically most of the time. I've been a bit overweight for the last 20 years but not like drastically overweight and I haven't got any, I've got mental health issues but I've got no really physical stuff of any kind of major concern you know so I haven't I never I didn't have that thing in my head saying oh it could be this my heart might be about to go or my 
our lungs are kicking in or whatever. So something changed. And I had these, I panicked due to how I was feeling. And that's what was different. As so different from the actual the anxiety attack that I had which kind of led to a panic attack I don't know but whatever you want to call it in 2002 I was just on the phone and my brain felt like it was melting you know everything just went weird like really it was almost like I was out of my own body and I thought I was going to drop down dead that's what I really thought I felt my, my, I didn't know I was having a stroke or, you know, I really wasn't sure what was going on. All I knew, and this is weird, the one thing I didn't want to do was fall down dead in the office. Because even at that point, in the throes of mental anguish, I was still concerned about how other people saw me. And I didn't want, you know, the ladies, perhaps one particular lady that I really liked, I didn't want her to see me fainting. Because in my mind, at that time, that was a huge, (laughs) it was a huge sign of weakness. That's how I used to think. I used to think it would be pathetic. The idea of having a panic attack would be absolutely ridiculous. And that's what weak people have. Of course, I know different now. But at that time, I was ignorant. I'm ignorant to many things now. But I was particularly ignorant to that. And sometimes the only way we can have knowledge of something is by experiencing it or see someone else experience it or studying it I, mean, I remember my friend who used to be a bit arsy with me when I had panic attacks when I was going through that two year period really intense two year, 2000, well, 2003, 2004 and I visit him, and my my legs would go numb, and he'd get the up with me because I'd travel to London to see him, and we always used to sort of do something, and I couldn't do anything because I was like a slave to the feelings I was having. Then a few years ago, he got diagnosed with depression. And he knew that I'd been through depression many times and stuff over the years. But he never had any uh, compassion, really, you know, towards it. Or no understanding. Sometimes compassion may need a bit of understanding. It's, you know... Compassion isn't necessarily something that you can just create. I mean, there are meditation practices and there are ways of increase and you know that kind of that part of your brain to think more kindly to others you know some people are born with it I wasn't I wasn't I was I think I really had much I don't know if I had much kindness in me so I'm not judging my friend that was just the way he was I had another friend that had never he didn't understand panic attacks and then one day he phoned me late at night and he was having one it's a different friend and I talked to him and I did my best to talk him down and just to calm him down um, but he until that happened he never understood it and there's no reason for anyone to understand it not really unless it happens to them I guess that would make sense, I suppose. 
I mean, why add more stuff that we've got to, that we've got to know about? I guess, I suppose. And you may be thinking, what's the point of what you're saying? Well, one point is there was two two kind of two two kinds of kind of panic attacks I had. There was the ones before 2002, where the panic came from something that happened previously, which hadn't bothered me before. But then it happened a few times. And that's why I stopped smoking uh, drugs. It was only weed, but I stopped because of that. Now, I didn't admit it to myself that there was a problem like anxiety. I knew that I was I was on and off antidepressants for since 2005, no, since 1995 rather. So 20, I don't know how many years that is, 24 years? But I didn't acknowledge it myself. I just figured it was the weed that was messing with my brain. And then, you know, I always attributed the environment to it. To the feelings I was having, like the coughing, and the kind of unable to breathe bit. And then then that would send me to a panic. And it seemed natural. Of course I'm going to panic. Why wouldn't someone panic if they were struggling to breathe? It's the, na- it's the most natural thing in the world, isn't it? Really. So I didn't give myself a hard time over it. Which in some ways, I think helped. Because I didn't expect to have them. So in a weird way, or maybe an unweird way, I kind of, by not making a big deal about it, to myself I mean, I didn't worry that there was going to be another one coming. So in a sense, I did say, fuck it. But not realising I was saying, fuck it. I didn't realise I was saying that. Let's use the word stuff it. Just for the sake, and just in case there are people that don't like the word. Or, who cares? Or, it doesn't matter. But when I had the the extreme anxiety in 2002, November, it was on a different ballpark. It was on a different level to anything I'd ever, ex- ever experienced in my life. And I had, yeah, I pretty much had two years of hell. The first year was the worst, 2003. Um, and I still went to work I still had a bit of time off but I went to work when I could still tried to keep my job keep everything going I was good at what I did and I was sitting there for 8 hours a day with an anxiety level that couldn't have been healthy for my body it could not have been good for my heart for my brain, for my body generally, my nervous system, or for my kidneys, you know, with that adrenaline running through my body, and I was just sitting there in a chair. So, I know I can't go back in time. But if I could, if I could... uh, that is a question actually we could all ask ourselves in various different situations but if you could go back in time to yourself or imagine the future you 20 years in the future coming back in a little t- 
time machine or a, a back to the future car or whatever you want. What advice would they give to you, bearing in mind they're still alive in 20 years time? They're healthy, you're healthy. What advice would they give to you regarding anxiety, stress and panic? What advice would they depart to you? What words of wisdom? What words of comfort would you give yourself? If you could go back to the first time you ever had an anxiety attack, and I don't want you to do that because obviously we need to stay in the moment here, but if you was able to, what would you say to yourself? What you know now? What words of comfort would you embark on yourself? Would you, what would you say? Maybe it'd be just one sentence. Maybe it would be as simple yet as powerful as a big hug. And it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Because sometimes that's that's the thing, you know, the best person in the world to give us a hug is us. I know you can kind of put your arms around yourself so you can do it. And maybe it's it's worth doing it. Even think I can't do it because I'm holding this microphone thing, but I kind of move my arms a bit and it feels nice. That kind of comfort. I think it's, uh, it can be quite easy sometimes to forget just how much we actually have available to ourselves, how much, I don't know what words you want to use for this, but How much love we have inside that can, we can actually share with ourselves. Those kind words that maybe we, we save for loved ones, for those in need, for those you know in difficult situations at difficult times. Well, how about saying it to yourself? How about hugging yourself and telling yourself that it's going to be okay? Because it is. It is going to be okay. And I, I realise it's nice to hear it from someone else. It's more important to hear it from yourself. It's more important to, it's to tell yourself, either inside or outside. You can say it out loud. You can look in the mirror every day. I look in the mirror every day just to make sure I'm still beautiful. I'm never disappointed. I have a I have a magic lying mirror. It's great. But if you just look in the mirror and say, I'm gonna be okay. You can say you're gonna be okay if you want. But you're talking to yourself. You are you. You don't have to make yourself a third person. Or second person, or whatever that would be. Because I know I say this, I've said this many times, but it's not, it's not nothing new to me. But the fact is, 
no one else in the world has spent every single second of your life with you except you no one in the world knows you the way that you know yourself there are people that can see your blind spots that you like we've all got blind spots and they're I don't mind about blind spots because they're called blind spots for a reason. You can't ever ever go to someone for their blind spots because they're blind. They can't see them. So all we can do is try to discover them and make whatever changes are needed for our own happiness, I suppose. But we know ourselves better than anybody knows us. We know ourselves better than anybody else will ever know us. We're the only ones that know what we're thinking. No one else does. And if people knew what each other were thinking, I'd be surprised if anyone would have friendships. It'd be very difficult because everyone would be, what are you thinking? Are you thinking that about me? Ooh. That's why it's it's quite nice to keep it inside they're just thoughts there used to be a time years and years and years ago okay sometimes happens still but there was a time when I used to think about doing something and then I'd start acting and emotionally reacting as if that thing was a permanent thing like it had to be done as an example I'm going to leave that job so I'm not going to go into work tomorrow and I'd start thinking about all the things that would happen and I wouldn't have any money coming in what if I couldn't get another job all these scenarios which is positive in a sense if it stops me doing something a bit erratic like just not turning up for work however it hadn't happened it was just thinking about it and at the time when I was a lot younger I didn't realise that these were just thoughts it almost felt like they were real When I was a child, I used to believe that what I thought would happen, that I was responsible for other people's actions. If someone fell over, that was me that caused that to happen. I realise I'm probably sharing way too, way too much with you. But it was wrong. It was faulty thinking. But I never told anybody what I was thinking. so I didn't have any corrections I didn't have anyone to say to me look it's, she fell over you were inside the school gate she fell over had nothing to do with you perhaps you could have called a teacher so she got have got some help but other than that you're not responsible so I kind of had to learn in a different way because I don't remember ever learning this stuff at school like you know thinking and realising that thoughts are just thoughts they're not real our brain thinks they're real our unconscious mind kind of believes what we think as well if we focus too much on it which means you can then control how you feel and you can have control over what your unconscious mind takes to heart. So believe in the... You can feel relaxed and calm and you can say fuck it to things that aren't actually that important. And you can allow yourself to just let go 
of some of those things for a little bit. Not really important to you. Because I don't know about you, I spent years trying to fit in unsuccessfully most of the time but I try to fit in with society try to pretend that certain things were important to me when they weren't because I wanted to at least at least at the very least disappear into the crowd you know not to stand out and I'd hear people talking and, you know, some of the prejudices and and I would never, well, at times I wouldn't ever say anything. I'd just let them get on with it. And I wouldn't contradict them and I wouldn't challenge them. But I didn't agree with them. And it takes a toll. I think putting up with people that are disagreeable, that are really hard work, and I'm guessing that we've all got people like that in our lives, or have had at certain points, and I would make a very big guess that I've been that difficult person for a few people over the years as well. So, you know, I am kind of... I'm open to that possibility that I was <laughs> I was the difficult person. I try not to be. Um, but when I was younger, I was a little bit more chaotic. And now, maybe it's an age thing. Maybe it's... But I don't think it needs to be because that's almost talking down to someone. You know, oh, you... Why should someone who's 18 or 22, why should they wait to be 49 before they can feel more relaxed? I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? It took me years to learn lots of different ways to get to the point of calming down. Hypnosis, NLP, meditation, writing, talking about things. Count. I became a counsellor. Did three-year degree in counselling in order to try and help myself to deal with my brain. Plus loads of medication over the years. Imagine how many wheelbarrows full of medication I've had since I was 25. Wow. So why wait when there are probably people and situations in your life that you just don't enjoy? and you don't like and maybe causes you have a a reaction a physical reaction an emotional reaction when you think about these things and you may blame it on stress and anxiety and panic when actually you just don't want to do it so I'll give an example. There's a workout in. And for whatever reason, for example, you cannot stand a colleague that you work with. You just don't want to see them outside of work. For whatever reason. And there's a work dinner, a work lunch. And instead of saying no, you say, oh yes. And then you get all anxious about it and start having palpitations and panic feelings. And you you blame it 
or I would blame it perhaps on anxiety. It's my anxiety or disorder. It's my panic disorder. It's my stress. When the fact could be, it's just that you don't want to spend time with that bastard from work. And why should you, if you don't have to? And as soon as you realise that, check your stress levels then. And you say, fuck it, I'm not going. I don't want to. You don't need a reason for anything, really. There's situations where perhaps you you feel you need to give a reason because otherwise someone might get upset. But ultimately, if you're listening to this, you're an adult. You don't need a reason or an excuse. As long as you're acting within the law of your land, whatever that may be, wherever you are, you don't have to give a reason. If you don't want to do something, then don't do it. If there might be consequences, of course. If your boss says, I need you to go, <laughs> I need you to go and work in you know, sit on the other chair and work at that other desk uh, for the rest of the week and you say no and you get reprimanded and sacked, well, that's, that's the result. But you still had a choice. But, you know, it's about thinking things through without just reacting. But it's still a choice. And that dawned on me a while back that actually, if you start thinking that way, a bit more about other things in your life, the fact is we do have much more choice than perhaps we give credit to or credit for. So I think the, the idea is, well, if there's going to be If you make a choice, you make a choice which is going to be um, harmful, then therefore you don't have a choice. It's still a choice. You just choose to do something that isn't going to cause you harm. Still a choice. It just means we have less of the victim, you know, self victim going on. Because we're not a victim in that situation, although we may be manipulated in that situation, which means that perhaps it's something that could be used to be changed. Because not everybody can just leave the job they're in. I had a job when I was being bullied. The woman was trying to bully me. And I wasn't financially able to leave. So I put up with it for about a month or two and then I left and I still didn't have the financial means in order to leave but I left and I got into financial problems and it was really difficult but I weighed it up I thought I'd rather have no money than have someone bully me or try to bully me. Whether it was the correct decision, financially it wasn't. But it was a decision, as it was a decision to stay there for two months when she'd started. Actually, it was longer than two months, really. But... Yeah, it was longer, but you know, I'm just saying it got worse and worse. There's always a choice. And I think the more of those crappy bits of our life we can remove, those things that we just don't like doing, the more relaxed we're going to be. 
So if you've got a friend that you don't like, which might sound like a weird thing, but I've had friends that I just didn't like, had enough of, and couldn't be bothered with anymore. Just for whatever reason, moved or you know, just moved apart, got different interests, they've been rude to me, or whatever. And sometimes it's good just to let them go. If that feels right. The idea of just saying fuck it. To all these... The idea of meaning full, the full bit. Everything's got meaning. Well, I don't think everything does have meaning. Or not the kind of meaning that I want in my life. The only thing that I do that feels meaningful is this. The rest of the stuff I do is just stuff. But then I live more the like kind of life that I want to live now. Not trying to please other people. Not trying to I just don't know, yeah. I mean this is more I don't want to really sort of get too much into my life because that might just be a personal thing for me. And everyone has to choose for yourself what you want to do. But ultimately, maybe start letting go of stuff. Because there's plenty of things that you don't have to do. And if you choose to do something that you don't have to do, it's a choice. And it's freeing. Even if you still do it, it's still freeing to remember and realise that you have a choice. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to eat. You'll feel ill the longer it goes without eating and eventually you'll die if you don't eat for long enough. So you do have to eat to stay alive. But it's your choice whether you eat and how much you eat. I don't have to eat that chocolate that's on the side. I guarantee you within half an hour of finishing this that chocolate will be in my tummy. that's a choice I know it's not the (laughs) the most healthiest thing to be eating but it's not my dinner I'm not getting up every day for having chocolate bar for my breakfast mind you no but we'll be into chocolate first thing in the morning not that I would judge anyone for having that But I think if I did that, I'd have no... I wouldn't have any teeth. I'm I'm happy with the three teeth I've got. I want to keep them. So what can you say fuck it to? How can you reduce your... full of meaning stuff the stuff that maybe is supposed to be meaningful but maybe isn't really to you but we've been told it is or you've been told it is or you feel that pressure maybe you don't want to do it maybe there's stuff there's things that you really don't want to do and it's got nothing to do with anxiety But actually, it causes anxiety because we're doing things we don't want to do. And of course, you can't get rid of everything unless you choose to. But that could end up leading to homelessness and no money, and which is a terrible situation to be in. So it's small steps. Maybe the odd big, big step. 
is leading you towards you where you want to be in your life. So if someone's got a situation where they don't like their job, don't like their partner, don't like their family, don't, don't like where they're living, don't like their body weight, then it can't all be changed at the same time. It's just choosing which is the thing that is most important at this point and knowing where you want to end up. So if you want to end up with an improved relationship with the person you're with, work towards that or whatever way you want to go there. Changing your body weight, that's something that can be done gradually. changing your job, changing where you live. All these things can be done. But it can take time. But when you realise that actually you've kind of got this plan, it takes away the stress and the pressure. Because it's something nice. When you think about it, think how you, if you're, if you're working and you, you work Monday to Friday, and it's three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, finish at five or six or whatever. That feeling, for most people, regardless whether they love their job or dislike their job, that feeling is nice to know there's only a couple of hours left that they're gonna have the weekend off, depending on obviously their home situation. Imagine what that would be like if there was no Friday afternoon and it was seven days continuous without a break, with no break to look forward to. I think that somehow, sometimes how we can get in our minds when it comes to things like jobs, relationships, how our body is, where we live, like it's some cow set in concrete and it's never going to change ever. When the fact is, everything will change regardless. I can say I'm going to live in my flat forever. If I have mobility issues, I will have to leave this flat because I won't be able to get up the stairs. You know, if I had serious mobility issues, I won't be able to get up the stairs, so I'll have to leave, no matter how much I love the flat. So nothing is sent, set in concrete, or stone, whatever you want to use for that analogy. But when you realise that actually this job you're in, that maybe isn't exactly how you want it to be, is... Not only is there a Friday afternoon or whatever day you finish for the week, you've also got that ending of the job. You know that you're going to be moving to a different job at some point. There is something to look forward to, something to plan for. which can give you a sense of release from that stress. Because that Friday afternoon feeling can be wonderful. I've worked in offices for years and there's such a different atmosphere on a Friday afternoon than at any other time during the week. There's a real, you can feel the winding down of pressure, even with the management. Even if there's a Saturday work, even if the people come in Saturday morning, there's still a, a degree of winding down, knowing that you got to the end of the week, you can relax, compared to if it was non-stop continuous which would be the difference between 
feel in that way with a job that you don't like, knowing that actually there is an end. So you can start to wind down. This can now be your Friday afternoon. So anyone that's in a job they dislike, this can now be your Friday afternoon. Three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. And the next two hours which could be the next year, even next five months, six months, whatever it is, that last little bit is where you're transferring and transforming and changing your job to somewhere that you want to be. So the, the way you feel changes when you look at it differently. And I do realise I I kind of move around from subject to subject sometimes and it's hopefully useful, hopefully, some of this stuff. But I'm wondering what in your life how much is there too much meaning in the sense of stuff that we're supposed to uh, care about that we're supposed to be interested in that we're supposed to give our time and energy to when actually perhaps you don't want to what things are you doing in your life that you don't like doing I mean that you really don't like doing and you can even up how many things in your life do you enjoy doing compared to how many things in your life that you don't enjoy doing. It's not about getting rid of everything you dislike doing because that's not reality. I mean, no one likes paying bills, but we all have to do it. No one likes wiping their bum, but we all have to do it. You know, it's stuff that we have to do. But if that list of things that you enjoy doing is shorter than the things that you dislike doing then there's something not right there and then out of that list of the things that you dislike doing how many of those things do you absolutely detest doing because then they're the ones that need to be looked at first and then you look at the things that you enjoy doing You need to do more of that. And also, out of the things you enjoy doing, on the other side, what things would you like to do? What things have you always wanted to do? Pleasurable things, just for the hell of it. Just because you want to. Just because you deserve to be happy. And you deserve to do things that give you pleasure. Just a few ideas. And that's all this is. That's all these recordings are. Just a bunch of ideas that may be useful. Thoughts and ideas to think about. To look at things a little bit differently. Just sometimes just slightly looking at something a little bit differently can change the way you feel dramatically. Going from an unpleasant feeling to a neutral feeling so it's like doesn't even it's almost like there's no longer a feeling there it's not really doesn't bother you anymore and if one thing has happened there if one part of your mind has changed, one idea has had an effect on this recording or any of the previous recordings on this podcast or any of my other podcasts on my website. And there's a hundred and 
1,150 recordings on my website that are free to download and listen to. That change can be an almost a domino effect, which then it lets you see what's possible that maybe you didn't realize was possible. And what's possible is what you can do. And in, in a way, you decide what is possible. Which is kind of quite a nice, a nice place to be, isn't it? Kind of a position to be where you actually have choices and we all know we do you know deep inside we know that we've got choices it's just hard to it can be hard to accept it it's hard to can sometimes be a little bit difficult to kind of get your head around the idea that actually yeah, I've got choices, but without blaming yourself, without criticising yourself. And I think that's that's where some forms of therapy come a little bit unstuck, maybe even uh, various spirituality, religions. Sometimes there can be a bit of blame, a bit too much blame. And blame is unhelpful let's use that word it's unhelpful so taking responsibility isn't taking the blame we don't need to have that word in our lives I like to think of the word blame as a cliche. Just another thing that people use, a word that people use without thinking about what they're saying. Something like there's no smoke without fire. You know, everything happens for a reason. People just saying stuff without thinking about what they're saying. Some people think about it, no doubt, but is it helpful? It all, almost feels like quitting and giving in sometimes. It's like, well, I have nothing I can do about it. Well, it's always something. Always something we can do about stuff. Always. Even if it's just accepting ourselves being gentle there's a lot to be said for being gentle you can transform your life being gentle to yourself transform your entire life very quickly because then you start treating yourself with respect treating yourself with kindness treating yourself with love you start to notice the things that you say to yourself I mean, when I used to see my nan, I used to, even as an adult, I was careful what I said to her. You know, I, I, I like to swear sometimes, and I'm rude and stuff. Not not with her, but, you know, just in my life, I can be a bit silly. Always respectful with her. So why can't I do that with my own brain? 
was how I started to think. I wouldn't walk up to a, a member of the police force and start saying stuff to them that I say to myself because I'd get arrested. Which means I can control what I say. And what you say comes from what you're thinking. So therefore, you do have some control. And it's not about controlling in a sense of someone being controlling. It's about noticing. It's about choosing. Being selective. So anyway, I've gone over the hour for this, which I don't normally do. So I'm going to wish you well, say goodbye. Uh, if you like what I do, please visit my website and leave a testimonial. Let others know if it's, you know, what's useful to you. Maybe mention the podcast that you listen to. And I'm going to leave you. So thank you very much for listening. And remember to say fuck it. I'll speak to you very soon. Remember to be kind to yourself because you do deserve to be happy. Lots of love.